Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Faith Library Podcast. This is Aaron, and we want to say thank you so much for supporting us through 2020. And now we are 2021, and we want to say also a Happy New Year because we're going to start a new, we're going to start another season, and our episode is going to be very, very interesting. And I want to say thank you for supporting us by subscribing to our channel, which is Faith Library PH, and on our Facebook page, which is Faith Library and also with our Spotify and Apple podcast. For more information, for if you want to support us, please do check out our Facebook page for more details about that. This episode, uh, our first episode for this year is going to be very, very interesting. And I believe it's one of the things that I wanted to address, especially in the times that we are in in our country and the times that uh, we are facing. And many people would label themselves as, quote unquote, mentally ill. But tonight we will... Uh, discover what it truly means to have mental health issues and the importance and significance of biblical counseling. I believe many churches have now missed the the significance, the one of the beauties of biblical counseling and what it what is biblical counseling. Our guest for tonight is Pastor Warren Lamb. He has been involved in the pastoral ministry for over thirty years, and he is a recovered psychologist having been a clinical psychologist trained at the University of Washington before coming to Christ at the age of 31. And he will uh, give it to us more of a story later on. And since that time, he has gained extensive experience in Christian ministry, including teaching, conference speaking, Bible counseling, and training biblical counselors. Trauma and abuse are significant areas of his counseling focus. In his book, Behind the Veil, Exposing the Evil of Domestic Oppression and Providing Hope, provides help and guidance for the church in identifying and addressing this rising problem in the church. And he's also working with exten- extensively with the sexually broken, including those struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction. He provides specialized training for churches, including shepherding churches, through the aftermath of a leader's moral failure. And after completing his uh, studies in Nazarene Bible College or the ministry study program, he pursued postgraduate studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Westminster Theological Seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary, and Reformed Theology Seminary, and receiving a Master of Theology and Master of Arts. And his passion is discipleship, helping people understand the nature and character of God so that they can fully live as Christ intended for them to live. Let's all welcome our guests for this year, Pastor Warren Lamb. Thank you, uh, Pastor. Welcome to the show. Thank you, and I appreciate it. It's an honor. Um, you are, of course, in the Philippines, yeah. and I'm way across the ocean in Southern California. Yeah, and I praise God that we can do this uh, episode together. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity, how technology, how God can use technology for this. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Pastor Warren, um, I've seen you've, uh, you've uh, uh, what do you call this, counseled a lot of people, not only but mental issues, but also people struggling with um, same-sex attraction and also uh, also for churches counseling, to help churches counseling. Uh, how is it? How is the experience? And I think I want to proceed to the first question is, can you tell us about your testimony and what led you to be where you are today? Because... Uh, this kind of ministry is kind of a, uh, for me, uh, it's it's tiring and at the same time, it's a bit challenging in my, on my end to understand a certain person's journey. Like you're going to journey with this person in, the, in another level of uh, being deeper and being uh, theological with him based on scripture and also dealing with his mental illnesses. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Sure, I'd be glad to, and, and um, I always appreciate an opportunity to to share with people um, how I'm a brand snatched from the fire. Um, maybe if I start with my anchor verses, yeah, uh, Corinthians, Second uh, Corinthians one verses three and four. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all in, God of, God of all encouragement who encourages us in all our troubles so that when we are be able to encourage those experiencing any trouble with the encouragement with which we ourselves are encouraged by God, or who, who comforts us, 
paraclesis, who comforts us in our afflictions. And with the comfort with which we have been comforted, we comfort those who are afflicted in every way. Which is why I do what I do, because I have a very, very dark, broken past. Um, I kind of half joke that I was raised by hyenas and potty trained at gunpoint. <laughs> Um, um, I, I did not grow up in the church. I had a lot of dark spiritual th influences, shamanism, Eastern mysticism, and Shinto and Buddhism growing wow. up. So I, a lot of families had, um, you know, a Bible or a family album on their coffee table. We had a Ouija board. So, wow. you know, so it, it was pretty dark. Um, anyway, um, when I separated from the Marine Corps in 1978, I had planned on being there for life and I got injured and couldn't maintain the job. So they sent me home. I said, well, what am I gonna do? And I said, well, I've got this GI Bill and I really would like to figure out why I am such a mess. Mm -hmm. So they had this clinical psychology program at University of Washington in Seattle, Washington, I thought. Mm -hmm. And they had a new program that was focusing on children and trauma. I thought, well, that's right up my alley. Mm -hmm. Well, in the midst of all that, I was also trying to figure out how not to become my father. Oh. So I was diagnosed with all kinds of things. I, I mean, all kinds of mental illness. <laughs> um, the longer I was in psychology, clinical psychology and training and, and all of that, the more questions it created and the fewer answers mm -hmm. it provided. And there really is no guidance in psychology. That's not the point of psychology. Psychology's yeah. point is to help you become more comfortable with your life. <clears throat> right. Um, and so they're, they're talking about transformation or any of those kinds of, it's not even, not even on the radar. Um, and so he, here I am. Oh, clinical psychologist and I've got no answers. As a matter of fact, I'm even more troubled than when I started. Oh. And the harder I press in, the more questions I ask and the, the more help I'm trying to find, the, the worse it's getting. And all of a sudden I am becoming my father and I don't know how to not become my father. So someone invited me to a Christian parenting class at a church being taught by a pastor's wife. And so I said, I got, I've tried everything else. I'll go to this. And I often say that I walked out of that uh, first session angrier and more hopeless than I've ever been because <laughs> there was absolutely no idea that I had about parenting that was right. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, I gotta, I gotta start from below scratch. I gotta, I'll just completely. Well, what do I do? Hmm. But I also had a little bit of hope because, okay, the what they're talking about sounds like what I would like to be more like. Um, and but I was still pretty rough around the edges, and um, not very lovable or easy to like. But these people really loved me with the love of Christ. So I'm getting this teaching, but I'm also experiencing the gospel in action. I'm experiencing the love of Christ through his people, which had it, I, I didn't even realize my soul and my heart were, had been longing for something like that my entire life. So 31 years old, I have a conversation with God one day and say, okay, God, if you're on the up and up, or if you're real and this Christianity stuff's on the up and up, you're going to have to show me because I got nothing else. And from that point forward, my life started to change. And I didn't even realize the changes that were taking place. But I opened up the word of God and was actually able to connect with it and understand it. You know, the things of the spirit are spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the word of God became understandable and it really came alive to me. And I developed this hunger, this ravenous hunger, because I'm 31 years old. I'm behind Mm, mm. late late so i end up with a sense of urgency and i really started digging into it um everything i'd learned everything i taught everything i'd written i started comparing with scripture and the more i delved into it the more i realized 
I don't, I know less than nothing. I know the wrong things. But I ran across a book very early. So I got into a, a directed st study program, bachelor of ministry program mm -hmm. through Church of Nazarene Bible College. And it was, you know, you worked with a proctor and did all the tests and all, you turn all your assignments in. One of the books that was required reading very early was Competent Counsel by Jay Adams. Mm -hmm. And he's the granddaddy of the modern biblical counseling movement. He just passed away a few months ago. Oh. <clears throat> but what he said in that book made so much sense that God's word is sufficient. God has provided us all knowledge regarding life and faith, according to 2 Peter 1, 3. Well, that's either true or it's not. Yeah. If it's really true, and I, I know the history of psychology. I know the history of modern psychological theory. Mm -hmm. And modern psycho psychological theory really got launched in 1886 in, in, in Austria, right? In, in Wilhelm Wundt's mm -hmm. psychology laboratory. I kind of joke that uh, these people who started psychology, everyone except for Carl Jung, were all atheists. Okay. Mm. Um, they were all Darwinists. Mm -hmm. They were all naturalists, materialists, nihilists, and humanists. Mm. So their belief is there is no God, and human beings don't even have really have a soul. Wait a minute. Suke logia, study of the soul. How do you study the soul from the perspective that man doesn't even have a soul? So obviously it's going to be broken down from the <laughs> But if you study the soul from the perspective of the one who created the soul, you had all kinds of answers. Mm. And that's what I kept finding. Um, and so <clears throat> I developed this amazing hunger for the Bible, for the word of God. Yeah. So I'm doing, I did very intense studies in hermeneutics, exegetics, biblical languages, did graduate, postgraduate work, you know, all that. And all the time, all the while, God had me counseling people because mm -hmm. that was my heart. That's why part of why I pursued psychology. But he's having me use the word of God and people are, are getting better because <laughs> It's not just their circumstances that are getting better. They're becoming better people. They're becoming mm. more Christ-like in the process. Mm. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Of mind. Right? Yeah. So I'm watching this happen. I'm experiencing this. Well, why would I not go all in? Mm. And so I, I did more studies in that. I did some training with Dr. Adams back in 89, 90. <laughs> um, I did a you know, THM and in, in uh, biblical studies, hermeneutics and in ex uh, Old Testament exegetics. Yeah. You know, I'm doing early church history and doing text criticism, continuing to come back mm -hmm. all the way back, continuing to come back to biblical counseling. And so <clears throat> that's what I've seen is God being able to take my own brokenness, mm -hmm. bring healing to my life mm -hmm. for the dark things that I experienced that psychology not only couldn't help with, didn't even know how to address. Hmm. And so out of the healing that I've experienced, God has had me doing this kind of counseling for over 30 years. So I have counseled over 4,000 people. Wow. Specifically in that, that amount of time, the vast majority of them come from trauma and abuse stories. Wow. So um, what, I, what I was going in to get my help for, for me, <clears throat> God is used to, to bless others. Amen. So that's kind of where I ended, how I ended up where I am. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've heard your story uh, with Parker in this episode with Parker Pensies, and I was really watching it over and over again. If, if mm -hmm. Parker's going to watch this, the most watched video of mine is your, this episode with you. And I would listen it over and over again because your story brings a lot gravity and depth to uh someone who is going through a lot in their lives and imagine if for counseling four thousand people so i don't know uh i'm just only recently i counseled a couple of people and i'm really stressed out <laughs> on handling this but you've actually counseled four thousand people it, it's a blessing and it's a lot of people actually is this from the us or is it internationally uh, there's abroad. I actually counsel internationally. So I be, thank God for Zoom. I started actually yeah. using Skype 
um, which I'm not a fan of anymore. But Zoom, <laughs> when when I discovered Zoom, um, I quickly adapted to that. And um, so I was already counseling some people overseas, who we call overseas from the U.S. Yeah. Um, but I have uh, there. I currently am counseling folks in in Africa, uh, India, uh, Europe, yeah. Costa Rica, Costa Rica, Canada. Um, counseled people, you know, again all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a conversation this morning with someone who's you know nine or nine thousand kilometers away, right? <laughs> it is, and just like us talking today. Yeah, it's like we're across the fence from each other, not across ocean and continent yeah right so and i really believe that god has provided this technology in advance knowing that we were going to need it yes actually right yeah uh just so you know in the philippines uh many people in the philippines having are having mental issues because they are inside their homes like many people in the philippines because we're a bit of a sanguine uh, uh, kind of people so we like to go out but we can't go out so we have to work at home we do things at home and Filipinos have a bit of uh, we are a bit impatient with a lot of things so uh, there are times that they would uh, see a lot and face a lot of situations and somehow they would say that they are now clinically depressed or they are mentally ill at some extent because they are just in the four corners of the room and maybe to those who are listening in the Philippines, maybe in the future, Pastor Warren, that you have people from the Philippines for your 4,001. <laughs> maybe. I, I counsel uh, several dozen people every week. Yeah. Um, um, and I also train biblical counselors three nights a week. Wow. Um, because there's such a critical need. Because part of it is because when we talk about mental illness, yeah. do you know that even... The professionals in the mental health industry can't even define mental illness. Oh, really? They really can't define it. And usually what they come down to is they say, okay, well, this person has this cluster of things going on in their, in their mind and their behavior. Yeah. And it's creating discomfort for them. That's a mental illness. Oh. Okay. So how, and we have to understand that the DSM that's all decided by committee. There's no, there's no, uh, um, um, what do you call it? Empirical data. There's no studies. There's no double blind studies. It's yeah. all decided by committee, everything. And diagnostic and statistical manual. There's no, no statistics in it anywhere ever. It never has been. So it's just a fancy name that means really nothing. <laughs> so it's like a commercialized term. It really is. The, the DSM. <laughs> so what's interesting about it is when you look at the DSM, depression, people talk about depression all the time. Yeah, a lot. When you take a look at the, how the DSM talks about depression, do you know what, they, what disqualifies from that? What's not really depression? If you're sad. If you've experienced, <laughs> if you've experienced a loss, like your yeah. loved one dies, mm-hmm. or you're completely isolated, Mm -hmm. right and you're sad about that that's loss that doesn't really classify as depression right so um that's kind of changing now they're kind of saying well we're going to include that okay but we have to understand that um a friend and colleague of mine wrote a book rethinking depression not a sickness not a sin it's not a very big book but very powerful dr daniel berger and what Daniel covers in this, and even on our website, you can find links on our counseling website to the teaching that he did, the presentation that he did. Um, the basically what he's saying is, when things go wrong, we're supposed to be sad. We're supposed to be upset. True. When someone dies, we're supposed to grieve and mourn. We're supposed to lament. Mm-hmm. The Bible talks about. Jesus being a man of sorrows. So being sad about things that, that violate God's created order is actually in keeping with God's design. So there's nothing wrong with you. You're actually experiencing what you're supposed to experience when these things happen. Mm. So 
depression? What, what is that really? Right? Sure, people get to the place where they're extremely hopeless, extremely helpless. They feel that. They're not really, but they feel that. Right? So think about that. That's not a mental illness. That's a faulty belief system. Mm -hmm. Ah, now mm -hmm. that's easy to address, isn't it? Yeah. Now it's going to be, that's more interesting. <laughs> faulty right? belief system. Everyone lives their life based on whether they, they believe to be most true at any moment. So the guy that believes that the best way to deal with feeling like a loser is to do porn. Mm -hmm. Or the gal that believes the best way to make herself feel better after being stood up for a date mm -hmm. is to eat a half gallon of ice cream. <laughs> Or the, the, the guy that believes that when he's feeling stressed, the best thing to do is drink a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. In that moment, they really believe that that's what's true, but that's being driven by their emotions. Mm. So they're not being rational, they're being reactive. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we talk about often is this is actually an emotional heart problem, not a mental illness. Mm. Because I have walked hundreds of people out of the depths of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, yeah. you know, um, uh, borderline personalities, all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. I was diagnosed with a bunch of that stuff. I didn't know Jesus Christ. I did not have a solid sense of my identity mm -hmm. in Christ because I didn't have one. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know and understand who God was. And I had no confidence in, in God. Mm -hmm. In biblical counseling, that's always what we're addressing because it doesn't matter what the brokenness is in a person's life, it will always come down to a lack of a solid grasp on identity in Christ, mm -hmm. a lack of a solid enough understanding of some aspect of God's nature and character, mm -hmm. and a lack of a solid confidence in some aspect of God's nature and character and how that intersects with the life. So those are the foundational problems. Those are manifest in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I, for years, I've kind of joked. I said, I'm really not all wise and insightful. I'm just a foundations guy. I crawl mm -hmm. under the house. I look at the foundation. I see what's weak, broken, yeah. missing. We repair the foundation and we can build. Mm. That's amazing. Like uh, now, now it's a bit more comfortable to hear that uh, it's not actually depression because uh many people would in the philippines uh, actually in our culture when we're just feeling sad a bit they call it, they're just gonna they're gonna text me oh i'm depressed what am i gonna do it's a bit it's 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 kind of a it's gonna try it's kind of a bit of challenging to deal with that kind of thing it's because they said they're depressed so the first question you're gonna ask them is are you really clinically depressed so all of these yeah. things well and so one of the things you, we can ask people is, so what makes you believe that you are depressed? Mm -hmm. What makes you believe that you are depressed? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just, you know, just really, really sad. I don't have any energy. Okay. All right. But when we're really sad, we do lack energy because what's our focus? Our focus is on what's lost. Mm -hmm. this pandemic right worldwide yeah. god created us to be in community mm -mm. right so when we are when community is torn away from us that's lost that's like a death mm -hmm. well we were never designed by god to experience death mm -hmm. death of relationship death of a loved one we are never designed by god to experience death so when we experience a death, a loss like that, it mm -hmm. has a devastating effect, at least for a time, until we learn to grieve and learn to find a new balance point, establish a new equilibrium to deal with life in light of what we've lost. Mm -hmm. So we can focus on, woe is me, alas and alack, oh, I've lost all this, or yes, I've lost all of this, but that doesn't define my life. That's mm -hmm. not who I am. It's circumstances that I'm faced, I've been faced with and I'm dealing with. And I can go to God and God gets it. 
think about Jesus at Lazarus's tomb, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. First, he says, and it was really interesting in the Greek, it says, Jesus, deeply indignant, not deeply moved, but deeply indignant, indignant. said, take me to where you've laid him. Oh, but he's been dead. Take me. He gets there and he sees everyone sad and wailing and he weeps for them. But then it says, Jesus, deeply indignant again, rolled up his sleeves and said, roll away the stone. Right. He was sad over what his creatures were experiencing because of mm -hmm. loss. But he wanted to show loss is only temporary. Mm -hmm. We kind of joke, half joke that Jesus disrupted every funeral he ever went to, including, <laughs> his, including his own. He's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come to think of it. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't. Yeah. He's not a fan of funerals. <laughs> right. And so when he raises Lazarus from the dead, he's making an announcement to everyone around him, the all of creation, including Satan himself. You got nothing, man. You got nothing. Mm. That's our hope. But if people don't have Christ, yeah, they're going to be sad and morose and lost and feel hopeless and helpless. But if you really know Christ, you anchor your hope in that. You have everything to hope for because no matter what you face, it's only temporary. Amen. Yeah, amen. Uh, thank you for that, Pastor Warren. It's really um comforting and also uh, spirit-filling to hear those words. And somehow that uh, we can see depression, all these things, is just a, a, a factor of what Christ has done and he did. And one of the things I realized that, that yeah, you're right. J Jesus was not a fan of funerals. <laughs> if I could just recall all the things in the Bible, yeah, he was not a fan of it. Like he would do everything to break out of that place. <laughs> tomb or shall we say yeah wow. yeah yeah so uh thank you uh, uh pastor Warner, for that and maybe later on before we end the show you can uh also um bring up your ministries or the training center so that maybe pe people listening in the philippines in manila can somehow get a mail from you and they can talk to you personally about uh their yeah. situation and who knows in the future we might have a webinar uh about uh, these things what do you think? I would love it. I, I would love it. I love those. Those are great. <laughs> All right. Sure. Let's do it. Let's plan on that. Yeah. But before we proceed to the second question, I just want to ask, since mm -hmm. you're, you studied in Westminster, so you're a Presbyterian, right? No. Oh, really? Wow. No, no, no. Because I, I went to Nazarene Bible College. Yeah. Then I went to TEDS, which is Evangelical Free. Yeah. Westminster, which is Presbyterian. DTS, yeah. which is mostly Baptist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was chasing down the leading teachers that I could find hmm. in the subjects that I wanted to study. Yeah. So at TEDS, hermeneutics was D.A. Carson and Old Testament uh. exegetics was Walter Kaiser. He was our, also our academic dean. Ooh. Right. DTS, text criticism, Dan Wallace. Mm -hmm. right. So it's like, where's the guy I want to study from? That's where I'm going. All right. That's cool. And you've come across from different seminaries. Have any pastor would ask you, like, why did you came here? Why, why did you study here? Like, <laughs> because it was who was teaching there and what they had to, what they yeah. had to which is what I wanted to, what I felt the need to learn. Because yeah. if you remember very early, I, I'm behind. I got to get caught up. Yeah, actually. Yeah. And how many years have you accumulated all these things from studying from Nazarene to uh, DTS and and, and Mr. How yeah, many goodness. years? So um, started, so I started a Nazarene Bible College in 1988. Wow. Finished first THM at TEDS in 90, second in 92, DTS in 94, <laughs> um, RT, and RTS I waited, Westminster was like 2000, no, 98, 
2000, 2001 was RTS. The thing is, is that I still take classes. Cool. Right. Yeah. I, I, I still think, take classes. Yeah. Yeah. I believe in our faith that it's, it's a never ending of learning and getting to know God in ourselves. And it's just a good thing. It's just one of the things that uh, God wants us to know him like every day. And that's why I believe that um, you've been healed by God's grace because your desire is to um, know him and to get to know him more and more as you learn from these people, these men of God that you've went into seminaries. And I believe it's a challenge for every Christian that's listening that uh, as we get into our sadness or in our situation in our lives or desperation, uh, let's not forget knowing our God because he's the one who can really completely heal us and restore us by his grace through Christ. Well, he's the only one that knows us and gets us. Yeah. Right. Why would I go to a human being who only knows in part, 1 Corinthians 13, mm -hmm. instead of going to the one who's omniscient, knows all things and never gets it wrong? Amen. Right. So in biblical counseling, we're not having you look inside mm -hmm. for your own solutions. We're leading you to the word of God, bringing you face to face with the Savior and helping you develop a strong healthy robust personal relationship with god in christ and walk with christ mm. so biblical counseling really is focused discipleship in a problem area in a person's life for a season right that's that's all it really is yeah it's discipleship but it's focused mm -hmm. and so when we train biblical counselors we teach them how to apply specific scriptural chains, if you will, mm -hmm. to particular struggles that people are having, but always bringing them back. Look, this is what God says about this. Mm -hmm. This is God's perspective. Mm -hmm. This is God's plan. This is God's remedy. Mm -hmm. See, we talk about God a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he's the only one with with the answers, but he does provide the answers. True. Wow. If so, people aren't coming yeah. to me looking for me to help them, they might think they are, mm -hmm. but they what they really are coming to me for is for me to point them to God and what God says about their condition, their situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because many churches uh, or many Christians, I think nowadays, know is this is like when they're going to a psychologist or maybe counseling. It's like going to a doctor or a physician that would somehow this doctor would treat them uh, a couple of you know uh, remedies or doses and then they just go out and then they would be having it, this expectation that it will be fine because I told the doctor everything I they need to know. So you told him your yeah. life story in fifteen minutes and he gave you a prescription and now you're good. Yeah. Does that really figure? Hmm. Not really. Yeah. Not yeah, right. yeah. Because don't forget, I went to psychologist, psychiatrist. And yeah. I was right. Yeah, it didn't help me a bit. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, they wanted to medicate me till to no end. Mm -hmm. The problem with medications, medications aren't designed to cure anything. They're actually neurotoxins that attach the brain, that attack the brain until the brain stopped doing this. Mm -hmm. But the brain fights back, says, "No, I I need to do this so I can sort through this." So that's the battle. That's why dosages have to change. That's why trying different medications. Mm -hmm. But they're medication. They're not medicine. Medicine brings cure. Medication masks symptoms. Uh, that's a shroom. Yeah. Because to be honest, uh, Pastor Warren, I've, I've, I, I had a journey with my skin because I have eczema. So I have a skin journey of my life. And there was a time that uh, two years ago that my skin got a rebound. So I cannot, you know, wake, I cannot go, go out. I can't walk. I can't really lie down. I can't do this. <laughs> we're doing. And uh, as I've researched about uh, my symptoms and everything that it is true, what you've said that medications are just mask symptoms. And that's what had, uh, really get me when I was in that time, I was really sad and low and, hearing these things would help me like to be low 
but it's good to hear that uh, to know the medicine and cure which is in Jesus Christ. And that's yeah. the reason I got up and overcome the pain that I was having physically. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's how God works. Yes. Yeah. By God's grace. So mm -hmm. now, now it's kind of a bit clear, but maybe to our listeners, it's not a bit kind of, you know, uh, uh, doesn't know the definition really of biblical counseling. And I, I believe that you've already given us a definition. Can you elaborate more of what you've said earlier? Can you repeat that the, the definition of biblical counseling and somehow sure. relation, its relationship between biblical counseling and psychology? There really is no relation. <laughs> okay. Um, so you cannot blend Yahweh worship and golden calf worship. Yeah. Never worked, never will. Mm. So biblical counseling is focused discipleship in a problem area of a person's life for a season. It's one redeemed individual mm. introducing another individual to the redeemer and his remedy. Mm. Okay. So we, and I kind of glanced again about this, but in psych psychology is grounded in atheism. There is no God. Mm. Well, Christianity and biblical counseling is not just grounded in, in theism or monotheism, but Trinitarianism, that there is one God who is triune in nature. Mm. They're Darwinists. Man is evolved, not created. Well, we believe in specific creationism. Mm that God specifically created this universe of all possible universes and is specifically intended that every creature that is part of this universe, he specifically intended that. They also are naturalists. So what you see is what you get. That's the, a matter of fact, at the beginning of the, the, the mini series, uh, the special cosmos that Carl Sagan did years ago, he said, the universe is all there the cosmos is all there is, all there was, all there hmm. will yeah. be. So basically, there is no God, never has been a God. Well, if that's true, then we really don't need a God, right? Because hmm. there's no God that exists. But Christians and biblical counselors believe in supernaturalism, that there are things outside of the natural world, including spirits, hmm. God, of course, and that prayer actually happen, does things, and miracles do happen. Mm. It's not scientific phenomenon. Yeah. There's also, they're also materialists, right? So man doesn't really have a soul, mm -hmm. right? We are only material. So what, what we think of as the mind really is only a result of chemical processes and mm. mechanical processes. Well... Christians and biblical counselors are dualists. We are material and immaterial. Mm -hmm. The man is not just a body, but he's also immaterial, mind, soul, spirit. Mm -hmm. Right? They're also nihilists. There really is no purpose and meaning to life. And when you die, you die. That's all there is. Mm -hmm. We're optimists. We believe that God created the optimum universe to accomplish his optimum best will of all possible universes. Mm. They're also humanists. Follow your heart. You have the end. You, you strive hard enough. You can reach your fullest potential. You know, um, um, you have the ability to find your own solutions. Eventually you can rise to the, and we believe what Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Right. So apart from Christ, there really is no hope. Mm -hmm. So you can see that all six of those theses are diametrically opposed. Well, definitely, if you take all six in one hand and all six in the other hand, you cannot get them to mesh. Mm -hmm. So philosophically and theologically, you couldn't get further apart. I see. So I want to ask this quick question. What do you think about Christian psychologists? Because there are, there are some. 
Uh, what do you think? Or any comments? So, and I've been around Christian psychologists a lot over the years. Mm -hmm. What you have is Christians who default to psychology. While the premises of psychology are not grounded in scripture. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, they don't even talk about, for the most part, about the Imago Dei. They don't talk about sin, repentance, substitutionary atonement, redemption. They don't, that's not even part of the conversation. Biblical counseling, we pray at least at the beginning and end of every session. We open up the word of God and we read from it and we teach from it. We interact with it. Prayer isn't a part. You don't mention Jesus Christ. And scripture isn't mentioned usually unless it's from the perspective of the counselee. Now, there are some Christian counselors who are more, they do lean more actually toward being more biblical counselors. But they're going to default to their diagnosis being rooted in the DSM. Mm. So what happens is when you use the worldly categories, you can't find God's solutions. Mm. because the bible doesn't have answers for addiction mm -mm. has all kinds of answers for idolatry because that's really what it is mm. okay? it doesn't have any answer for you know a mental illness i have this disease but it has all kinds of answers for sin yeah okay because if if this is a disease well i don't need a savior so jesus is no good to me True. You see the problem? Mm. Yeah. People think that's too simplistic. Like I said, I've been doing this a really, really long time, and I stay up to date <laughs> on what's going on in the psycho psychological mm. community. And something I've noticed over the last couple of decades is about every seven years, the same articles get recycled through with a little bit different language, a little bit different focus, and different names, but it's mm. pretty much the same material. Mm. That's that's interesting. It's interesting. So like they're they're just recycling the things that in the past, and then you just you just kind of repackage it into a a, a new thing that oh is this is a new clinical disorder or something of some sort. Well, that's why we now have the DSM five, right? The DSM, uh, DSM two, right? We've yeah. got all these variations. Yeah. yeah. Because it's fluid. No, it isn't. Mm -hmm. It really is not. Well, we've learned so much. No, you've actually learned less because you're diluting it so far mm -hmm. that things that used to be considered deviant be deviant behavior is now considered normal and actually preferable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God's standards never change. Mm -hmm. And his True. word doesn't change. So am I going to trust a book created by men that changes every couple of decades? Or am I going to trust the word of God that is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, mm -hmm. separating soul and spirit, bones and marrow, discerning even the very motivations of the heart, that which is God-breathed? Mm -hmm. Amen. What am I going to follow and believe? Well, I tried the other. And most of the people that I've counseled over the last three decades have tried the other. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so uh, I want to ask this also. Let's go to the other extreme. Okay. You know, uh, uh, we we have this we call it the Jordan Peterson era. That uh, yes. that that I like uh, Jordan Peterson. I really yeah. like him. He's a straight shooter. Yeah, and he may not be a believer, but a lot of the stuff he says is right on the money. Yeah, but I think um, he has a couple of things that you've said, like like uh, you can you can solve it for yourself. You have to man up for yourself. You get to Fix your room, as I said, and fix your bed. What do you think about uh, how uh, Dr. Peterson would face psychology or use psychology? His psychology and psychiatry failed him and almost killed him. Right? Hmm. Yeah. So that would be a question I'd pose to him. Dr. <laughs> Peterson, do you really put your faith and trust? in the system that almost killed you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How can you? I, I, th that to me mm -hmm. is even a greater sell seller to run and not look, over, not look back. Mm -hmm. 
because the underlying definitions created a paradigm, created a belief system that led down a path of destruction because they're mm. lies, they're inaccurate, mm. they're incomplete. Mm. And we have to remember, not everything in psychology is lies, but it's not all, not the full truth either. Is, mm. is that how the enemy works? He wraps a lie in truth, mm. which makes it palatable, makes it believable but inside is poison and it's going to kill you mm. and that's it what ends up happening i felt i felt horrible for what happened to him the medications but mm. understand he believed that those neurotoxins were going to help they can't they're neurotoxins that attack the brain they can't help mm. they can they can mask your symptoms for a minute but they really are not going to cure the underlying beliefs that are defective and the, mm -hmm. and the damage see because this is what we have to understand we have unresolved sin between us and god we have the after effects of the evils we've suffered from other people's sins mm -hmm. and then we have the ongoing lies we believe as a result of all of it those are the things that have to be addressed. And that's what we do in biblical counseling consistently. Amen. But there is an extreme on the biblical counseling side where it's like, okay, well, we're going to identify the idols. We're going to bring down those idols. No, that is not biblical counseling. So if, you, if, you're, if you're sitting down with somebody and they're, in the, in their, they're identifying idols of the heart and all that stuff, mm -hmm. They got a very limited, narrow f view of what biblical counseling is supposed to be and how it's supposed to work. Okay, because the Holy Spirit diagnoses the problem through the Word of God. Mm -hmm. My job isn't to say, "Okay, come on in, let's do the idol detection, and then we're going to evict the idols." Mm -hmm. That becomes Christianized cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. It's not transformation. Mm. Amen. You know, I was a fan of Dr. Peterson for what he's doing in his ministry. It's yeah. just my prayer that he would look at what he's saying as his identity in Christ. Because <laughs> almost what he's saying is really tough, it's really good. And actually, it's a bit of common sense. He's going he's gonna to talk about things. But it's my prayer that he would uh, look at the worldview that he is using and would repent and to turn to Christ. In, yeah. yeah yeah it's my prayer for him yeah yeah so so i i really love the what you said the jordan peterson era that it surpasses it and i just want to ask that question because i want to uh look at from biblical counselors of what is their take on um about jordan peterson at all and another quick question he's, he's, yeah. a, he's, a, he's a wise very intelligent man yeah. and i mean it's like Yay, somebody from the other side is speaking yeah. the truth about this stuff. Yeah. What's missing in all of that is the pointing to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah. I want to do a quick question also. Um, is going to psychiatrists a good thing for Christians? Like example, your uh, your parent or you yourself are clinically uh, mentally ill you're really clinically having problems because one of our in one of our church members has uh problems and um their family decided to go to a psychiatrist is it good or is it advisable uh, as a biblical counselor i deal with a lot of folks who've been to psychologists and psychiatrists who are even being medicated mm -hmm. as they come for counseling We never tell them that we're, our goal is to get them off the medication. But what we tell mm -hmm. them is our goal is to deal with the underlying brokenness that makes you believe you need the medication. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've walked hundreds of people diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, borderline personality disorder. Out of those medications, 
out of those the, those places where they really believed it because the underlying brokenness is not being addressed. Mm-hmm. Very interesting book. Robert Gans wrote a book years ago called Psychobabble. Okay. And he was a psychiatrist mm-hmm. in a mental institution that dealt with schizophrenic patients. Mm-hmm. Well, he started bringing the gospel to work. He started talking to his schizophrenic pair patients about forgiveness. They started getting well and leaving. <laughs> he got fired because he was costing them money. Oh. So when people say they, they have a real mental illness, if I hit you in the head with a rock, you've got a mental illness. <laughs> okay. Because see, the problem is if you've got a piano and lousy music is coming out of it, Mm. the way the secularists and psychology and psychology, psychology and psychiatry say, there's something wrong with the piano. Yeah. Nobody's paying attention to the pianist. Nobody's paying attention to the heart, soul, and mind of the individual who's playing the piano. Mm. Mm. The piano isn't the problem. I mean, the piano may be a little out of tune, mm-hmm. but that's not the problem. The problem is the pianist is angry. Isn't reading the music. Mm-hmm. Isn't cooperating with, you know, sitting in an orchestra and isn't following the conductor. It's not the piano. It's the problem. It's the operator. It's the pianist. The brain is a piano. The mind is the pianist. Now it's clear. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. The renewing of the mind. I, I, I believe that verse would somehow gives us a support of our identity in Christ and also our transformation by being renewed in our minds. I think one of the questions that I want to ask you is, uh, we have read in the scriptures like the heart and the mind is deceitful above all things. So how can we reconcile uh, being renewed in the mind and at the same time that our mind and heart problem? Really good question. Second Corinthians 5, 17, if any was in Christ, he's a new creation. The oldest mm-hmm. passed away, behold, all things mm-hmm. become new. Mm-hmm. Right? So, yes, you were dead mm-hmm. in your iniquity and trespasses and sin, but you've been made alive together in Christ. Mm-hmm. That's what you were. That was your condition, but now that's no longer is the case. Mm-hmm. So, Amen. Christ is indwelling us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Metamorpho, it's a passive <laughs> verb in the Greek. Mm-hmm. Okay? caterpillar into butterfly but it's a passive verb so it's something that's done to us or for us the renewing the mind part is our part Mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean freshen up the old it means replace with new right so as we saturate whatever we saturate our minds with is what we believe Mm -hmm. what we believe is what we live so if we saturate our hearts and minds with the word of god the Holy Spirit will bring transformation. What's really interesting about that? Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> in Psalm 1, we see, blessed is a man who does not walk in the way of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. His delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Well, that's not mindless yom, but mm-hmm. that term comes from animal husbandry and it means to chew the cud. The word is ruminate. Mm. Well, think so. Um, because of neuroplasticity of the brain, right? Whatever we continue to rehearse establishes new neural pathways, which establishes new habits, mm-hmm. which establishes a new pattern of life. I actually do a talk on this. And again, it's on our counseling website. Mm-hmm. There's a video people can watch my presentation. Washing with the water of the words, science and scripture finally agree. Mm -hmm. Because that renewing of the mind takes place, or or the transformation takes place as we renew our mind. So as I'm saturating on God's word and saturating on the truth of God's word, 
what I believe changes. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my life changes. What's really interesting is about three years ago now, people in the world of psychology said, well, this neuro the neurologists are, are doing this and helping people with traumatic brain injury, and mm -hmm. dealing with deep, deep, you know, anxiety and these kinds of things. I wonder if it would work for personality disorders, which, by the way, there really is no science for that. <laughs> um, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, <clears throat> wonder if this would work for narcissists. So what they did was they they started doing with it with a with a group of narcissists and say, OK, when you start behaving this way, you're going to ruminate. They actually use that word. You're going to ruminate on. I will not get I will not yell at my wife mm. and I will not slam my fist on the table, whatever it happens to be. So when you start to feel that. So guess what? As they're ruminating on that the behavior starts to change. Mm -hmm. That's neuroplasticity of the brain. Neuroplasticity of the brain is how we learn to drive, how we learn languages, how we mm -hmm. learn musical instruments. Matter of fact, are you right-handed or left-handed? Uh, in writing, I'm right-handed. In basketball, I'm left-handed. <laughs> okay. So let's say we're, you were to decide, okay, starting tomorrow, mm -hmm. all the writing I'm going to do is going to now be left-handed. Mm. okay <clears throat> that's going to be very uncomfortable yeah very sloppy uncoordinated unattractive mm -hmm. very difficult but it won't take very long and pretty soon you will be able to develop the same level of precision precision with your left hand that you had with your right hand because the right hand skill set has stopped being used those neural pathways have stopped being used and so mm -hmm. they've started to atrophy and you've established new neural pathways to do it with a left hand and those become strong and they replace it mm -hmm. be transformed by the renewing of your mind you see how it all ties together yeah so it's more of like a habit well that's how habits are formed mm -hmm. you you 60 no 300 repetitions establishes a new neural pathway Mm -hmm. 63 days of reinforcing that is a new habit. Mm -hmm. So imagine, say, I'm going to get into a regimen of saturating on scripture, physically reading scripture out loud 30, 50, 100 times a day. Well, in three days, you've established a new neural pathway and you continue that day after day after week after month. And everything is transformed in a short period of time oh so it's like one of the things that we need is not only asking the right questions but also to read scripture out loud yes because <clears throat> when um when we read scripture the lower brain is activated, energized, and that's where the amygdala is, and that sorts information mm -hmm. and categorizes it, right? Well, so that's when we see it, right? When we, when we read it out loud, okay, the, um, the, where the hippocampus is that helps categorize stuff and starts comparing with what we know, mm -hmm. memory, Right. When we hear it, then the emotional part of our brain, emotion and memory are really activated. Mm -hmm. And then when we think about it, a prefrontal cortex rationality and reason are activated. So when you physically read it out loud, all four major regions of the brain are activated and energized simultaneously. Oh. Memorization is an intellectual exercise. Mm. Saturation is a heart, mind, soul transformation exercise. Mm -hmm. So as you read, you reflect. As you read out loud, you reflect. You can't help it. <laughs> you can't yeah. help it. <laughs> Actually. And reading it out loud, faith comes by hearing. Mm -hmm. So you need to hear it. And if you're reading it out loud, 
you can't help but think about it. And even if you're not thinking about it right now, mm-hmm. chew the cud. Think about how that works. Okay, the, the, the little sheep eats the grass, mm-hmm. chews on it, pulls nutrients out, swallows it. It comes up later and he chews on it some more, pulls more nutrients out, swallows it mm-hmm. again. Brings it up later, chews on it more, pulls more nutrients out, swallows it again. Mm. Okay. The living word of God, the Holy Spirit will bring it to mind and you ruminate on it. Mm. And it goes to rest. And then when you need it again, the Holy Spirit will bring it to mind. Mm. If you eat a salad, you don't say, okay, I need the, these nutrients to go here and these nutrients to go here and these nutrients to go here. Mm. No, your metabolism does that. Mm. So as you're ingesting the living word of God written by the Holy Spirit, who recognizes his own voice, as he brings that to mind, and you ruminate on that, he applies it where it needs to go. That's the transformation. Caterpillar Mm. and a butterfly. Mm. That's the word, metamorpho. Metamorpho. Actually, it's my favorite Greek word. Metamorpho. It's like right. I, I plan to have a tattoo of that. <laughs> it's You're like to re- Yeah, to to remind me of myself. To, to renew, to renew, to renew. Yeah. But the thing is, is as the renewing of the mind is what the Holy Spirit uses to bring transformation. Mm. Be transformed. It's passive. It's done to us or for us. We don't do that. Mm. So it's already been done. So the be transforms already been done. And the renewing of our minds is our responsibility. Well, our, as we renew the mind, we provide the raw materials to the Holy Spirit for mm. him to bring the transformation. It's the ideal partnership. Mm. As we renew the mind, that's the raw materials the, the Holy Spirit uses to bring transformation. Right? Mm. If, you, if you plant vegetables in your garden, you have to tend the garden. That's what we're doing by continuing to saturate on the word of God. We're renewing the mind. We're tending the garden. Mm. Now it's a bit clear now. So it's like we have all the resources that the spirit would gives us, and it's our responsibility to use it. Right. Right. Mm. Because it is a partnership. Mm. It is being yoked together with Christ. Mm. Yes. Amen. Amen. Wow. And what's interesting about it is people are always running around going, love, love, joy, peace. I got to develop. No, you can't develop those things. That's the fruit of the spirit. So as you surrender to the spirit, he produces that fruit in you. Mm. We're not responsible for producing or developing the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. We're responsible to surrender to and partner with the Holy Spirit as he produces his fruit in us. Amen. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, as we go along in our session, our conversation today, it, it's a blessing to hear uh, all these things. You know, um, I, I'm, really, I'm really blessed to hear your story at the same time to how to treat these issues, quote unquote, uh, in, in, in our society today. And it's a bit more clear now. It's more, um, we can say, it's more comfortable to hear rather than when we say that there's he's having this kind of sickness or this kind of issue. It's, it's somehow, it's a bit challenging for us Christians or maybe if you're in the ministry or, or you're a pastor to deal with these things. It's because they say that they're ill. Uh, but actually, as uh, you, Pastor Warren, uh, gave us a, a a clear definition of biblical counseling and how to deal with it. It brings so much, uh, brings so much clarity and also security of us of who we are in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And it's a blessing that uh, I can have this conversation with you. And I hope that this will not be our last. <laughs> and I always love talking about this stuff. I get, as yeah. you can tell, I get really excited about it. Yeah. Um, Part of it is because this is what God has used to transform my own life. Mm, actually. And I've watched him transform thousands of lives through this, the same means. Yeah. Amen. And it's actually 4,000. And then you're going to have well, people. Well, not just that, but it's, it's 
the lives they've impacted and the biblical counselors that I've trained who yeah. duplicated out. Mm. Right. So yeah. I have no idea who all has been impacted by what God has taught me. Mm. But that's why it's, it's, we call, it's discipleship. Yeah. Right. It's like I'm one disciple of Jesus Christ that he's transformed in this way. I've shared that with other people and discipled others, and they are doing the same thing. They are discipling others as well. Mm. Amen. Amen. So it's focused discipleship for a season. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen to that, Pastor Warren. And you know what? I have a friend that who's studying now at, uh, in the School of Psychology in the Philippines, but he's also a leader in the ministry. So uh, if you're watching Brother Emmanuel Tamargo, uh, I, I I hope you can have a conversation with Pastor Warren. It's going to be a wonderful time to have a conversation with you because he's also leaning towards the biblical counseling uh, part. Uh, and I had him a few episodes a couple of uh, months ago. Yeah, and uh, he gave us an introduction of um, how to deal with depression and also how uh, the church uh, would respond to these kinds of uh, things. And somehow, and then you've came along now and really suppressed or really uh, gave us a, a, a clear definition of biblical counseling. So it somehow, you know, my goal to to unite the two of you and all two of these terms, now it's become a reality. <laughs> I am I am always delight, delighted to partner with God to rescue someone else from the world of psychology and bring them <laughs> over, rescue them from the dark side or bring them over. <laughs> <laughs> dark side yeah. yeah you know you know pastor warren I'm, I'm enjoying a conversation with you but you know uh maybe this is not a psychological psychological term but time is catching up on us yes. i know if it's just a psychological term but uh uh thank you so much for being this on the show pastor warren uh it's been a joy an honor and also a a a a a, a, a yeah it's truly a joy and honor to have you on the show and to converse with you and to schedule this time and making time for us for dealing these issues and also the the, the importance and significance of biblical counseling. It, it can This can be your um, closing statement. So the last question will be, what is your encouragement for Christians or non-believers that to look into scripture and turn to Christ for healing? Every human being is created in the image of God. No matter where you've been, what you've done, what's been done to you. And the Imago Dei makes you priceless to God. Because if we were not worth it to God, the gospel makes no sense. So no matter how worthless, how lost, how hopeless you feel, those are feelings based in lies. Because God says not only are you priceless, but he created you for a purpose of all the universes that he could create out of an infinite number and variety of universes. He created the universe that would accomplish his optimum best will. And it's the universe that you exist in. So you are part of his ultimate best plan to accomplish his best will. Thank you, Pastor Warren, for being on the show. It's a blessing and an honor and hope I can talk to you soon. Maybe. I'm the, I was the one going to be counseled. <laughs> I'm going to in the future. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, been a, it's been a real honor and a delight to be a part of this. Um, again, um, I hope that what we've talked about and how we've talked about it today, again, honors God, but also provides hope and encouragement and even curiosity for people. I want to understand more. I want to pursue this more. Yeah. So they can go to our websites. They can take a look at stuff that we have available and just dig away. Yeah. So what's the website, uh, Pastor Warren? Uh, can uh, you give it to us? The basic website is T-I-L-B-C-C.com. That stands for Truth in Love Biblical Counseling Center. T-I-L-B-C-C.com. And from there, you can go to the counseling track or you can go to the training track. Yeah. And so uh, we're going to put this on our bio in the description in our uh, premiere which is T-I-L-B-C-C 
www.biblicaltruthinlove.com or this is Truth in Love Biblical Counseling Center. So we're going to put that up on our bio so you can check it out. And if you have any questions, you can, uh, I think there's a source there that you can email uh, Pastor Warren and give a message to him. And Lord willing, uh, that you can meet with Pastor Warren, such as like this that we are doing. Thank you, Pastor Warren. And I hope we can have a webinar and also another episode with you. Yeah. Thank you. Stay tuned for more episodes. We will upload more, a ton of videos coming on your way. And thank you so much for supporting us. If you want to support Faith Library, please do support us by uh, clicking on our Facebook page and see the details of how can you support and partner with us to provide resources for every Filipino Christian. For now, this is Aaron. See you all and God bless.